Welcome to Barnard Castle, a wonderful little town located in the upper reaches of the mighty River Tees, in deeply rural County Durham. Taking its name from the castle that stands before us, Barnard Castle has an intriguing and often action-packed history, which has seen this rather geographically isolated town take centre stage on a national level on numerous occasions. We'll explore that history on this tour of the town centre on this cloudy morning, but we begin with Barnard Castle itself, the ruins of which stand above the River Tees behind the trees to our right. The castle was first built at the turn of the 12th century in the early years of England's Norman era, but it was subsequently expanded over time. Most of the ruins that we can see today date from the 13th century, a period when Barnard Castle was growing in significance and so began to grow in size too. The tower before us here is one of the oldest parts of the whole castle, built around the year 1200, a long time before Barnard Castle fell into ruin. But how did this once formidable castle end up in ruins? And why was it built in the middle of rural northern England anyway? Well, the castle was positioned above an important crossing of the major river Tees, and this allowed the Normans, who were seeking to cement their authority over England after their victory at the Battle of Hastings, to control a river crossing that formed part of a historic Roman road across the Pennine Hills, and which had developed into an important cross-country trading route. In its early days, the castle belonged to the de Balliol family, nobles who had arrived in Great Britain from Normandy, and had been granted land by the new King William II. Originally a small castle, this building was extended in the mid-12th century by Bernard de Balliol, and then his son, also named Bernard. Their work on the castle led to the fortress being christened Bernard's Castle, a moniker that was then applied to the small village that began to develop outside the castle. The work of Bernard de Balliol and his son turned Barnard Castle into one of the most extensive, luxurious castles in the region at the time, fit for even a king to stay in. And as luck would have it, King John stayed at Barnard Castle in 1216, while in the region on a military campaign to quash northern rebels. Later that same year, the castle had its first experience of major conflict, besieged by forces supporting the Scottish King Alexander II, who was moving into northern England. That siege on Barnard Castle failed, however, and the period that came afterwards saw its reputation soar to new heights. For much of the medieval era, Barnard Castle was particularly prosperous, at one point even belonging to King Richard III. But after Richard's defeat in the Wars of the Roses, the castle passed into the hands of the Tudor-supporting Bowes family, who held it until a brutal siege of 1569, which caused the ruins that we see today. The siege, which saw 11 days of bombardment, was part of an effort by northern rebels to depose the Protestant Tudor Queen Elizabeth I, and to put the Catholic Mary Queen of Scots on the English throne. The heavy assault left Barnard Castle in tatters, and the Bowes family surrendered to the rebels, but as we'll see later on, their name wasn't forgotten. Moving away from the captivating ruins of Barnard Castle now, and as we pass by the town's Grand Methodist Church, built in 1884, we mention that this town is rather geographically isolated in County Durham. To get a better idea of that, let's take a look at its position on a map. As you can see, Barnard Castle is located in deepest County Durham, to the east of the town of Darlington, and just northwest of the wild Yorkshire Dales. Located on the northern bank of the River Tees, Barnard Castle once stood right on the edge of the historic county of Yorkshire, although the reform of county borders in 1974 saw both sides of the Tees in this area being absorbed into County Durham. But we've now made our way away from the riverside and castle, now finding ourselves right in the heart of modern-day Barnard Castle, which with a population of just over 5,000 is the largest town for miles in this heavily rural region. This is Gallgate, part of the main road which winds its way through the heart of Barnard Castle and down towards the River Tees beneath the castle. Gallgate is thought to roughly follow the route of the old Roman road that ran through the countryside here, 
and which linked two historic Roman forts, at Bowes, just over the Tees here, and at Binchester, near the modern town of Bishop Auckland, 15 miles to the northeast. It's likely that, during the Roman era, there was a small settlement here in Barnard Castle, but no remains of that time are to be found in the town today. Here on Gulgate, though, we find a slightly more modern landmark, a grand townhouse that once belonged to one Roderick Murchison, a famed geologist and explorer of the 19th century. In his early career, Murchison lived here in Barnard Castle, and while he died in 1871, his name is remembered not just all over the world, but there's also a crater on the moon named after Murchison too. Here at the end of Gulgate, meanwhile, the road is slightly wider than down by the church, and as such, it became the venue for Barnard Castle's old cattle market. As the only market town for miles around, farmers from across the countryside would historically herd their livestock to this point for sale. Now, the old cattle market site is occupied by modern shops and car park spaces, but Barnard Castle is still an important site for the trade of livestock. On the street behind the buildings in front of us, you'll find the lively Barnard Castle Auction Mart, founded in 1980, and a hugely important livestock market for the almost entirely agricultural region that surrounds Barnard Castle in all directions. Looking in the direction of the centre of Gulgate, meanwhile, we can see Barnard Castle's old town drinking fountain, which was placed here in 1874, during Britain's Great Industrial Revolution. But while the Industrial Revolution reshaped the map of the nation, with new cities and towns exploding into life on the back of industry, that never really caught on here in Barnard Castle. County Durham developed as a hub of coal and steel production, but in this part of the countryside, Barnard Castle was all about more traditional industries like hand weaving and spinning, along with a number of small-scale local trades, some of which came to national attention. One of those was Humphreys Clockmakers, a historic clockmaking store in the town, and which inspired Master Humphreys Clock, written by the great Charles Dickens a couple of years after he visited Barnard Castle, looking for inspiration for a future novel. From here, we'll make our way towards the old hotel where Dickens stayed on his much commemorated visit to Barnard Castle back in 1838, and which stands on the main road through town that takes a different name as it swings left from Gulgate here. After Gulgate, the main road becomes Horse Market, which is home to a number of Barnard Castle's oldest establishments, and a row of shops that still form the heart of what is today a bustling little market town. But it actually wasn't until the 17th century that Barnard Castle began to grow to the size that we see today, a symptom of having grown around its namesake castle where we started our walk. In the medieval era, many villages emerged on the outskirts of rural castles, as people moved into the area to supply soldiers and their families with goods. This gave birth to small settlements, with Barnard Castle awarded a charter to hold markets in the year 1178. But the ravages of the many sieges on Barnard Castle in the medieval era meant that there was always instability for the village's future. It wasn't until after the siege of 1569, which caused the castle to fall into ruin, that the town of Barnard Castle actually began to develop independently of the historic fortress, no longer threatened with being caught up in yet another assault on the castle. Barnard Castle has since grown into a fully-fledged market town, with weekly Wednesday markets having been held since the 13th century, and a monthly Saturday market now added to the town's roster, both of which are partly held on the slightly wider Market Place here. Looking over Market Place, we find the Witham, a grand hall of the 1840s that takes its name from Henry T. M. Witham, a popular local figure who contributed greatly to Barnard Castle in the 19th century. This hall, funded by Witham, was originally built to provide medical and educational facilities to the townspeople, but it now serves as a popular arts centre, complete with a grand central hall and stage where many local plays are performed. 
The Witham is one of the grandest buildings standing in the centre of Barnard Castle today, but just across the road from it, we'll find one of the oldest buildings in town. This is the Golden Lion Pub, established all the way back in 1679. It originally opened as a coaching inn, serving travellers passing through Barnard Castle, but it's today a cosy traditional pub, whose beer garden at the rear actually backs on to the castle ruins. Spinning around from the Golden Lion now, this side of Marketplace is where the famous Humphreys Clockmakers once stood. As we mentioned, it was Humphreys Clockmakers of Barnard Castle that inspired Charles Dickens's Master Humphreys Clock. Now, Master Humphreys Clock wasn't a novel like Great Expectations or A Christmas Carol. Instead, it was a weekly periodical published throughout 1840 and 1841, which contained short stories narrated by Master Humphrey, followed by two of Dickens' novels. The Master Humphrey that narrates the short stories was actually written as a London man with a love for storytelling, and who kept manuscripts in an old grandfather clock. But the real Master Humphrey was actually from Barnard Castle here, which Dickens visited in 1838 to collect material for another of his novels. That was his third novel, Nicholas Nickleby, the story of a man working at a harsh Yorkshire boarding school. In preparation for the novel, Dickens came here to research the region's boarding schools, basing the school in the story on the nearby Bowes Academy. And it was in this building, directly opposite Humphrey's Clockmakers, that Dickens stayed for two days in February of 1838. At the time, this building was the King's Head, a central town inn that's now used as a care home. Dickens' stay in Barnard Castle is more than just a bit of inconsequential trivia, as the publication of Nicholas Nickleby, based on a nearby boarding school, had serious repercussions for schools in this region. The book exposed the incredibly harsh treatment of many students in Yorkshire boarding schools, sparking a public outcry that led many, including the Bowes Academy, to be closed down permanently. Now, here at the end of Marketplace, we find one of Barnard Castle's most famous and recognisable landmarks, the Butter Market. Built in 1747, and now sitting at the centre of a roundabout, the Butter Market has long been an important spot in town, having taken on a variety of uses over its nearly 300 years of existence. The Butter Market has been used as everything from a town hall to a jailhouse, a courtroom and even a fire station but it wasn't until the 1930s that it gained its current name. The butter market takes its name from the fact that, from the 1930s, the wives of farmers from the surrounding area would come here to sell dairy products to the people of the town. The butter market therefore continued to mark the site of Barnard Castle's important market for this rural region, one of the original purposes for which it was built, replacing an old toll booth that stood at the entrance to the centre of town. Today, the Butter Market has no particular use, although it's been well preserved as a symbol of historic Barnard Castle. The only significant change over the last three centuries is that the building was once surrounded by wooden walls, but these were removed because they obstructed the vision of drivers entering and exiting Barnard Castle. There's nothing obstructing our view of the building ahead though. This is the beautiful St Mary's Church, the parish church of Barnard Castle that has stood here for nearly 900 years. First built in the year 1130 as Bernard de Balliol was expanding his castle, the church that we see today still features relics from that time, including the church door, which dates to the 12th century. The tower, meanwhile, was an addition of the year 1270, and which was further heightened in the 17th century, making St Mary's an intriguing mishmash of different eras much like the captivating range of architecture that we've seen so far on our walk around Barnard Castle. Many of the buildings in this humble market town are of both modest size and modest design, but from here, we'll now make our way towards a landmark that's anything but the frankly ridiculously huge Bose Museum, located on the edge of Barnard Castle. It'll take us about five minutes to reach the museum, 
which looked like a French chateau that mysteriously appeared in northern England. But on our way, there's more to discuss about this town, including the legacy of St Mary's Church, which, like the butter market, has also had a variety of uses over time, having served as a town hall, a fire station, and even a theatre. But the church is most notable for its links with King Richard III, who once owned Barnard Castle, and who sought to build up St Mary's here as one of England's great churches. The plan was that Richard, immensely keen on Barnard Castle itself, would use St Mary's as the foundation to establish a grand religious college, to which scholars from across the country would come to study, just a few steps away from Richard's residence. The college would have made Barnard Castle's St Mary's one of the country's finest religious institutes, but history sadly got in the way. After becoming king in 1483, Richard had more pressing issues to deal with, including the climactic years of the Wars of the Roses. Famously, Richard was killed at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, the last king of England to die in battle. His death therefore put an end to plans for the Great College of St Mary here in Barnard Castle, although the church still bears a rare contemporary carving of Richard's face, which reminds us of his deep connection to it and Barnard Castle as a whole. But as we now walk along Newgate out of the town centre and towards the Bowes Museum, there's another visitor to Barnard Castle who we haven't yet mentioned. Long after the siege of 1569 that left Richard III's beloved castle in tatters, a leading figure in England's political sphere arrived in town, and whose brief visit to Barnard Castle is still remembered to this day. That visitor was of course Oliver Cromwell, who came to Barnard Castle in 1648, near the end of the English Civil War. At this point, his parliamentarians had established a firm grip on Northern England, which had started the war as a royalist stronghold. He stayed just down the hill from the butter market in Blaygrave's house, a 16th century inn that's the oldest house in Barnard Castle, and where there's still a plaque commemorating his visit. But even after Cromwell, there were more notable visitors to Barnard Castle, one being the celebrated painter J.M.W. Turner, who came to the town in the 1820s and painted this famous watercolour of Barnard Castle as it looms above the Tees and the historic crossing point of the river. One of a number of people who made fleeting but memorable visits to Barnard Castle, Turner is also one of the many artists whose work is featured at the town's Bowes Museum, which we're nearing as we walk away from the town centre. The Bowes Museum has one of the widest and most diverse art collections in Britain, with everything from Renaissance-era paintings to artefacts that tell the story of local history, and even a famous swan. The collection is absolutely magnificent, and that makes Barnard Castle one of the few places in the world where there are nearly as many priceless artworks as there are people in the town. We'll talk more about the Bowes Museum and one of its most famous artworks in a moment, but here on the edge of central Barnard Castle, we can see another St Mary's Church, this one being the town's main Catholic church, built in 1928. Originally, Catholic church services were held in the town centre at the Union Hall, but as Barnard Castle grew in size over time, and its Catholic community steadily grew with it, a new church, St Mary's here, was needed to serve them. St Mary's today now stands just outside the grounds of the Bowes Museum, which you'll find behind the wall beside us here. Apart from the castle itself, the Bowes Museum is the biggest attraction for visitors to Barnard Castle, and it takes its name from the art collector John Bowes, a member of the local nobility who founded the museum in the late 19th century. As we mentioned, the museum is home to a wealth of artworks and a spectacularly diverse collection, but it's most famous as the home of the Silver Swan, 
a spectacular sculpture of 1773 that draws admirers from all over the world. This is an image of the famous Silver Swan, which is more than just a beautiful ornament, but a marvel of engineering. The swan is made of glass, metal and shining silver, which decorate an interior that's composed of clockwork contraptions that make the swan appear like it's alive. The engineering for the silver swan is absolutely remarkable given that it was made in the 18th century, and its clockwork design doesn't create jerky, puppet-like movements, but rather a graceful and amazingly lifelike performance that's always the highlight of a visit to the immense Bose Museum. If you're in Barnard Castle and you have the time, catching a performance of the Silver Swan in action is an absolute must. But even if you don't get the chance to tour the inside of the Bose Museum, simply viewing it from the outside is marvellous enough. Turning into the museum grounds now, this is the truly immense Bose Museum a staggering piece of architecture that stands today as a proud Barnard Castle landmark. The museum is designed in the style of an imperial French chateau, more akin to the kind of building you'd see on the outskirts of Paris than County Durham. The reason for this is that founders John Bowes and his Parisian wife Josephine Bowes funded the museum, which was jointly designed by an architect from Newcastle and one from Paris. And so as surprising as it is to see in this part of the world, the Bose Museum makes for a fascinating fusion of Anglo-French culture, and a wonderful place to end our walk around Barnard Castle. Thank you so much for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you're now looking forward to visiting Barnard Castle for yourself in the future.